Natalie, how did you find Bitcoin and how has it changed your life? <laughs> well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It was really nice to meet you at one of the recent conferences. Um, Bitcoin really has changed my life. I found it actually in 2017. And like so many people, I dismissed it. I was skeptical. I thought because it's digital, it can be hacked and it can all go to zero. Uh, so I was very wary of it at first. Um, and then I, it took me years to really understand it. I, I went down the rabbit hole. I got my hands on every book that I could find about not just Bitcoin, but also the history of money, what your show is about. What is money? Uh, we're, we're really not taught that in school. We're not taught about money printing and, and all the things we actually need to understand about the banking system. And so when I really learned about Bitcoin, I discovered that it's, it's really the best solution that we have available to fix some of the most pressing issues facing society at large. And I think the biggest problem at the, at the root of, of everything we're facing today is really that we can't save for the future. It's just harder and harder to plan for the future, to achieve financial security, to take care of a family, um, to be able to take care of your kids and, and, and grandkids. And I think that Bitcoin um, is the best store of value and savings technology that has ever been engineered, in addition to the fact that it is an amazing payments network that I think will do amazing things globally as well. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. And, and the thing about it is it's only starting. We're just yeah. at the very, very beginning. Uh, more since like 2020, a lot of more educational uh, programs has come up. More people are teaching people about Bitcoin. Yeah, so it's only yes. starting. It's all about the educational. And thank Absolutely. Um, e like even when... Yeah, even when I started to learn about it, there weren't as many books and podcast shows and, and platforms that are teaching about it as there are now. Obviously, the institutions had not come in and legitimized the space. People like Michael Saylor uh, were not, you know, pro proponents of Bitcoin. And, and a lot has happened in the last couple of years. So it's really fun to be on this journey because I think that this is such a revolutionary technology that soon everyone's going to be using. And, and we're going to look back and think how fast it all happened, even though it feels kind of slow when you're going through it yeah definitely definitely and, and something I'd, li I'd like to touch on there a little bit okay why bitcoin and not crypto so can you explain a little bit of a difference between because there's a lot of confusion around all that as well natalie i think isn't there yeah yeah i mean there really is and i had that confusion as well when i first started i sort of lumped them all in the same uh category i thought everything was um uh as risky as as the one that came before and after um but i had to really learn about blockchain t technology i had to understand the blockchain trilemma and why bitcoin really is the the only um cryptocurrency that exists that is truly decentralized and truly secure and and scarce. Whereas the ones that came afterwards, many, you know, technologists probably had really great intentions, but unfortunately those protocols are not as secure. They're not as immune to being compromised or 51% attacked. Um, or at the base layer, the technology um, just doesn't function as well as Bitcoin over the long run, because when you make adjustments and trade-offs, like for example, making the block size bigger to accommodate for more transactions and making it faster, well, down the road, not everyone's able to say run a node. And so that could impact its decentralization. And we've seen pro protocols um, that issue tokens to insiders before, bef and then they release it to the public at large. That's a security. Um, we've seen people change protocols, um, protocols that have gone down. And so I, I just, I'm really wary about everything else in the space. I see it as largely a, a space of unregistered securities and people should be very careful. Whereas I see Bitcoin as being the only cryptocurrency that has all the monetary properties that are needed to serve as a global base layer to sort of rebuild the economy we currently have on something that's more um, that's more strong at the base layer, like bedrock, so that we can build on top of it and have a more fair system of opportunity. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, and 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 on that point as well, okay. Uh, what I'm seeing in 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 the space that I think a lot more women need to start learning about Bitcoin. Yeah, as like a great and an amazing savings technology for the for the family. Yeah. And yes. how can we help more women start learning about this? And, and why are they not, do you think, they're not learning about it as men, much as men? Because when we go to this conference, there's normally like 95% <laughs> men or more. 
compared to women, yeah. unless they're like me and Laura and we bring the whole family with us and Theo. <laughs> Yeah, it was great to to meet your family. It was so inspiring. Uh, luckily, I think things are moving in the right direction. Since the first conference that I went to, I'm definitely seeing more women getting involved. Um, I, I'm I'm a part of that mission. I, I try to host Bitcoin events for women so that they can feel like they're represented and they can network and build community with people just like them. And so I think it's really important for us to support each other. And when a woman sees another woman, maybe in a in an industry or in a certain role that that makes her feel a little bit more comfortable or inspired to get involved as well. Um, and so that's that that's what it's going to take, really. So if you have a woman in your life and you're passionate about Bitcoin, bring her into the fold, invite her to an event or tell her about some of our women's events that that might make her feel a little bit more more welcome. Um, and and I, I just why they're not represented as much. I mean, I'm not really sure other than to say that Bitcoin brings together a lot of different um a lot of different levels of expertise in terms of industries like engineering, finance, computer science, programming, and all of those industries are typically male dominated. Um, now, what what does that say about men and women? I'm, you know, your analysis is probably as good as mine. One thing that I have found in my life and my career is that women really love community and helping one another and having that sort of nurturing role. And um, and so a lot of them pursue careers where they're they're dealing with people as opposed to maybe things or computers. And that's not to say that that's the case for everyone, but that's just been my observation. And so I. I think that the more that we build the community and the social social layer of Bitcoin, the more that women will come in as well and do a great job to, to make people feel more comfortable. Um, and in addition to that, they are really drivers of, of wealth around the world. They they hold, hold the purse strings for the family. They're making financial decisions for, for both their partners and their children in a lot of families. They are making more in terms of income than they ever have in the past. So they need a find out about the best savings technology, right? And I hope that they feel empowered when they learn about Bitcoin. Yeah, definitely. And, and I, I think the thing as well, Natalie, they don't have to get too focused or too uh, stressed out about the technology end of things because there's a mm -hmm. whole lot more to Bitcoin than just yeah. going down the technology aspect right. of it. And a lot of yeah. people get afraid of that part of it. Yes, completely. And I was one of those people too. <laughs> so Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. And so we, we all were, because I missed this years ago. I'm a little bit uh, mature or older than yourself, but I missed this at $30 when my friends were there buying loads of it around me and wow. just playing around with it. You know, but it is what it is. <laughs> I'm here now <laughs> and I'm well I know. in. We I'm all well get it at now. the price we deserve. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Yeah. Uh, let's talk a little bit about gold and silver. Yeah. Compared to Bitcoin. Yeah, I recently seen there that you had an amazing interview with Andy Sheckman, who is a mm -hmm. total gold and silver person. Yeah, yeah. But I also seen there that he's now he's allocating thirty three percent every second week or every month of his stack to Bitcoin. So it was mm -hmm. fifty fifty before from Bitcoin and uh, gold and silver. Mm -hmm. Now he's added thirty three percent in there. So why? Question is why do you think other gold investments investor do not see Bitcoin as the winning asset for the 21st century. I think it's just going to take some some time for the the tide to turn. I mean, gold has the the history on Bitcoin. Even though Bitcoin is better in in terms of so many of the other properties, um especially portability, especially um verifiability, but you know, gold has a track a track record of thousands of years. Um, it's a reserve asset that people feel comfortable with. That central banks have been buying. It's that pristine collateral for the physical world that I think so many people have trusted for a long time. And I think it really takes um, people like Andy, who was intellectually curious and remained humble and open to learning, um, where he saw that that Bitcoin is sort of a digital version of gold and, and we're transitioning to a digital economy that needs something that is hard at the base layer, but that is truly decentralized and secure. And so once you kind of get to that to that level of understanding, I think it makes so much sense to start to allocate um, a, a greater and greater portion to Bitcoin. And it's really it was really exciting to hear him say that he was going to invest in gold. I was a part of some of those or uh, in Bitcoin from just gold. Yeah. And uh, 
it, I was part of some of those discussions. And so I'm, I'm grateful that, that, uh, that we opened up another gold bug's eyes. And you helped orange pill him, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> Happy days. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and that being said, okay, there is a lot of other gold people that have looked at Bitcoin as well. I believe, yeah, I truly believe that they have, uh, and we can, we, we, there's a couple of them that we know that you've even talked to yourself and they are very, because I've seen videos from years ago that they were completely explaining about Bitcoin. So what's, what, like, what's going on? You know, what, what do you think is really going on? Are they trying to protect um, their own businesses maybe, or are they trying to like, what's... well, sure. I, I, I think that that exists mm -hmm. in, within many of different assets classes, right? I mean, someone who's done really well in equities probably is slow to divest and move into something like Bitcoin, someone who has who's works in the government, right? And and really wants to maintain that that control that that they have over the financial system maybe is is wary of Bitcoin. People who have long been um gold holders and gold bugs, they really trust it. I I've never met someone though who has genuinely put in the hours that are required to understand Bitcoin who turns away from it. I don't. I mean, P Peter Schiff is someone that I just uh, interviewed on my sh show again, and he tells me that he's done the homework and he just it, he's totally against Bitcoin, doesn't believe in it. But it's it's hard for me to believe that because I think that he and so many other people out there are very intelligent. And if they really, really understood the protocol really understood the technology aspect because they they understand the economics they understand the macro side but if they really understood this technology and how unbreakable and how immutable and incorruptible it is i don't see how you could be against it especially when it comes to just allocating a tiny bit i mean some people they're getting started and so of course they're not going to necessarily put 50 percent of their wealth in right like someone that that has maybe been in the space five ten years but to start out at this point to not just have one percent or 2%, um, I think that that is going to be a decision that has many negative consequences down the road. And so it is inspiring to see that people are changing, the, the tide is turning, but it is slow slow to change. Yeah. But that being said, I'd say that their children are into Bitcoin and they understand the, 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 the like what's coming. Because a lot of kids now and younger people, they know about all these games. They can see the value in buying swords online yeah. and yeah. Uh, all different types of things. And from what I know, I think Peter's son is big into Bitcoin as well. Yeah, I, or at least, he was. at least he was. I'm not sure. I haven't heard from Spencer in a bit. But um, yes, I've heard also that uh, Jamie Dimon, the CEO of Chase, that his daughter has purchased Bitcoin. And there are politicians whose children uh, own Bitcoin. So I think that it's going to be a generational shift, obviously, when it comes to technologies going from analog to digital. It does sometimes take older generations some time to catch up. Um, it's so much easier when it's sort of native to you as you grow up with it. And, and that's another reason why I think Bitcoin will be that winning horse compared to something like gold, because I don't know a single young person, as like millennials and younger Gen Z and, and those coming after them who are planning to invest in gold or pur purchasing gold bars, but they do, you know, send everything electronically via wallets on their, on their iPhones and iPads. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, and the world is changing so, so yeah. fast, Like we can see the fast changing because like we're yeah. looking at more of the macro thing a few yeah. years ago. I wouldn't be, I'd just be looking at the, the micro locally, my own business, but since 2020, and when I discovered about the money printing and what's actually going to yeah. happen that year in 2020, I realized uh, I need to start looking at this and protecting my family. Yeah. Yep. I know. And it's it's really sad to think that around the world, there are so many people who don't have really the chance to to save. They're kind of living paycheck to paycheck, they're not able to put anything away and, and acquire real assets. Because if you look at who's been able to retain and build wealth, it's the people who hold 
assets. It's not the people who save in cash or just accumulate a, a stack of actual physical currency. You have to hold something that is more scarce. Um, and so real estate and stocks have really been the main drivers of wealth creation over the last 10, 20 years, because when they print all this money, it has to kind of go somewhere. And if you look at the chart of where, where it's tracked, the S&P 500 in the United States, the main investing income or index has increased at the same rate that the money supply has increased. So you're not even really making money. You're just keeping track with how much they're inflating the, the, the base money supply. Um, and then, you know, of course, who has the time when they're a hairdresser or a doctor or an accountant to, to study every stock that exists and just choose stocks and become day traders and know when to sell and when to buy? I mean, it's ludicrous that we live in a system that forces you to have to do that or forces you to try to become some sort of landlord for Airbnbs, uh, like manage all these different real estate properties, because those are the only ways to actually have your money grow and increase in a way that outpaces the inflation and the cost of living increases. It's really sad. And this is what we need to fix. We need to have good money again. And we haven't in a long time. Yeah. But, 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 but I think as well, Natalie, we've been conditioned, we've been conditioned to go down that route and, and, yeah. and do those type of things. And, and yes. listen, poor people like us. Okay. And we are in the grand scheme of things have been always taught to earn income. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What I'm doing now yeah. is growing my wealth. And there's a right. huge difference in that. Yes. Yeah? So yes. I don't need to earn okay. income. We have a great business. It generates income. Uh, I'm make, I have a wealth creation strategy now. And that's mm -hmm. kind of what I to be showing people. And I work with a lot of dentists. And that's what I teach them what, yeah. what, what to do, how to grow their wealth. Yeah, and yeah it's, it's great. I was on an Instagram the other day and I saw a video. It was supposed to be kind of a a trick of how you can make a lot of money very quickly and easily without putting anything of your own money up front. And it was just talking about essentially getting loans and leveraging all the debt that we can actually take on and bu building a portfolio of real estate that you then rent out as um as kind of like a low in low income housing and so people are just taking on debt after debt after debt and they don't realize i think that they're that two things are happening number 1 the banks don't have that that money sitting anywhere, right? Like it doesn't exist where they're there. It's someone else's savings that they're lending to you. They just add it to their ledger. They make it out of thin air. So they're fractionally reserved banking. So it's adding to the money supply as well. And it's diluting the value of everyone's units because it's creating essentially infinite dollars. But at the same time, it's adding leverage to the system. It's adding more debt. So when the house of cards actually falls, it's going to be a harder, more dramatic collapse because everyone is relying on every other counterparty. And once that contagion takes off, it spreads like wildfire and the whole thing comes tumbling down unless they can like puff it back up like the, the bubble that it is. So it's really sad because you're right. I mean, everyone's conditioned to just, hey, I'll take out debt and we'll they'll keep spending. Why don't they just print more money? We can pay off the debt. I mean, people have such a lack of understanding of the fact that at the base of all of this needs to be savings. It needs to be deferred consumption in the form of savings so that you can have and take that capital and actually be productive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and let's touch a little bit about on currency, okay, and the fiat, Ponzi, as we know it as, but a lot more other people mightn't, yeah, because there's probably a lot of new people that might catch this interview, okay? What's going on with fiat currency, and how is people's local currency actually making them poor over time? Yeah, well, going back to what we mentioned earlier, you can't save in cash. The The value of your dollar or your uh, pound or your euro, it's going down every single day because they're printing more units. And and it's it's just math, right? At, at the base layer, when you really drill it down to the most simple factors, it's the fact that they keep printing more, the supply is increasing, and so each unit can purchase you less purchase you less. Um, and it's really sad when you zoom out, the purchasing power of our currencies has just been destroyed. And it's so easy for uh, central authorities like governments and central banks to just hit a stroke of a key and produce as many units of the currency as possible. And no one has a say in it. No one gets to vote. No one can say, no, please don't do that because I want to retain the value of my money. It just happens. And it's this regressive pernicious tax on everyone.
And so everyone does become sort of desperate chasing for yield and has to take on more risk when it comes to investing and figuring out what to do to actually build wealth because you can no longer rely on the money that it, money should be enough, right? Like, I mean, you should go to your job and be able to save for your future. I don't see why that that sounds like such a taboo thing to say, right? Um, but we can't anymore. And it's just, it's just designed that way because if you can make something very easily, no one is going to be able to resist that temptation. No government, no human. We're all fallible. We're all, you know, um, we're all going to choose sometimes the short term um, benefits over mm. the long term consequences. And that's what governments do. And and so we need to change that we need to move to a system where the money is very, very difficult to create. And Bitcoin is the most difficult money to create. It is now harder than gold. It is the most scarce asset in the world. And that's why I think it's going to shine when it comes to being the best store of value for the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and to, to, to just to elaborate on that a little bit, yeah? So once people figure that out, okay, how do they protect themselves from monetary devaluation? A lot of people think that they can't do anything, but Bitcoiners have found a way. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's, I think a lot of people think you need to have enough money to buy a whole Bitcoin. And that's one of the greatest misconceptions. You can start accumulating with just a couple of dollars. You can, I think the best way to really start to understand and appreciate something is to actually use it, to download a wallet, to um, be sent some Satoshis or or purchase a little bit and just start using it and then, and then learn about it so that you can really appreciate what this technology is. And, and the fact that you can, for the first time, send value, send monetary value across the world to someone in, um, in a country that is thousands of miles away from you. And you don't have to have an intermediary involved that takes a cut and monitors and surveils that transaction. And you don't have to wait a month on the back end for it to actually settle. It settles within a couple minutes or a couple seconds if you're using the Lightning Network. And that is a transformative technology. And that is extremely empowering for the individual because we are losing a lot of our freedom and our privacy. And, and financial privacy and freedom is, I think, the most important of all. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And let's talk a little bit about the freedom and the hope that we see when you when 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 we uh, learn about Bitcoin and a little bit about why is Bitcoin our insurance for what is coming? Yeah, I mean, I always say Bitcoin is hope, and it is hope for me. Um, I really genuinely mean that when I say it because before I learned about Bitcoin, I was starting to become very negative about the future. I was working as a journalist. I was covering, you know, some of the worst events that would happen in in my country or the city that I was working in, and it was really difficult to to see the population grow increasingly polarized and divided. Everyone was turning into, you know, it's this team versus that team, us versus them. Everyone kind of like hating each other all of a sudden. And, and bringing politics into every issue. And I, I was really saddened and disappointed by it because I tried to look out into the future and I could not think of something that would actually fix it. I felt like everyone was sort of becoming more... Um, you know, you need you need to get yourself figured out and run, you know, f f kind of take care of yourself and don't worry about anyone else. Like it's just, it turns into this big competition instead of a cooperative um collaborative economy and society. It just felt like everyone's just in it for themselves because it's survival mode that kicks in and people feel so frustrated and they don't know what to do. And when I learned about Bitcoin, it was truly like this, this ray of light that was, that was shined down on me where I thought, oh, we can fix it. The thing that we need to most address is the base layer of all of our interactions, which is money. We, we exchange value and goods and services using money, and we need the money to be something that we can actually trust and rely on. We can't trust the money now because it erodes and the purchasing power disappears and a few people are in control and they benefit at the expense of everyone else. So we need a strike at the heart of that very problem. And Bitcoin was the first thing that I, I learned about where I was like, oh, we finally can through technology, through innovation and through a movement that is really us, the people sharing this story, we can make a difference and and hopefully lead ourselves to a more abundant and hopeful and props, prosperous future.
Yeah, definitely, definitely. And regarding the community in Bitcoin as well, what would you say about the community? Like, isn't it amazing the people that we're connecting to? How do we ever got connected? How am I connected to other people that have been on my podcast and the people that are coming as well on the podcast? Like, it's like we're all there to help each other. Yeah, no, the community is is one of the most important. I mean, I think it's the most important part because if no one uses Bitcoin and no one, there is no community, then then I don't think it would work very well. But um, it's such an interesting space to be involved in. I mean, first of all, you have to take a step back and realize that inter the internet empowered Bitcoin and the internet also empowered us to be able to communicate with one another across the entire globe. So the internet allowed us to communicate and, and transmit value in terms of information. Bitcoin allows the internet to transfer money and, and, and monetary value across the globe in a very similar way. So I, I always think of Bitcoin as sort of the internet of money. And a lot of people don't really know how the internet works. Um, but the community is, is, is an amazing one because so many of us share the same mission, values, principles, desires. And it's fun to interact and, and meet with one another, especially knowing that there are so many of us around the world just distributed and decentralized, just like the protocol. Um, and, and we get together at these conferences. And yes, we definitely need more women, but um, but the events and everything is just so fun and and it's empowering and inspiring. And I've loved being a part of it. Um, so yeah, the community's great. It is totally, totally amazing. I've never come across a community like it before. And yeah. I've been involved in different industries and different businesses in my lifetime. And uh, just the help that, that, that people are willing to give and give their time and jump on Zooms like this and just help each other. And we're yeah, hoping that help other people as well. Yeah, Greg Foss, um, who I have had on my show a couple of times, he said it really well. He said that Bitcoin is a community of givers. Whereas the legacy system, it has a lot of people at the top controlling it who are takers. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And then regarding Bitcoin and property rights, a lot of people, I think, for the last, as I said, for a number of years, yeah, even myself, used to think about physical property. That's what we want, to have something in our hand that we can touch and we can feel, and even real estate or gold or different things, yeah, but... Bitcoin is a much, much better property and much stronger property. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? And even people that are in different countries, looks what's going on around the world, around right. us, what's happening. And, and these things can happen very, very quickly in other countries as well. I know we might be in the West and we haven't seen some of the aggression that other countries have seen. Let's talk about property rights. Right. I mean, you've brought up some really, really great points. Um, never before have we had an asset that really the total addressable market is 8 billion people around the world. There, there are so many nations where someone can't just go online and purchase a share of Apple stock or purchase a fraction of the, a Manhattan skyscraper, right, to save for the future. But literally everyone can start to accumulate Bitcoin and protect themselves and save for the future. And then on top of that, it is this digital form of property that no one can seize from you. No one can confiscate from you. No one can censor you from being a part of it. All of it is completely voluntary and open and transparent. So it is revolutionary in so many ways. And it's it's through technology that I think we will be able to secure everyone's property rights around the world, which is so important and critical to being able to build wealth and to be able to plan for the future and take care of the, your loved ones and your future descendants. Um, I think a lot of us don't maybe appreciate how important property rights are. There are still so many countries where people have none, billions of people living in authoritarian, oppressive regimes. And even though there are a lot of problems in the West, we um, have the best property rights in terms of, of historically what people have been able to accumulate. And the system is very broken, but we, at the, at the very core, we need to make sure to protect property rights at all costs, because I can only imagine how enslaved a world would be if you had to work and, and what you worked so hard for and the value that you earned was not yours to keep. And it was ultimately um, at the hands of someone else to decide what to do with. And today, unfortunately, we're starting to strip people of a lot of their property, because if you work really hard and you can't afford to, to 
buy, say like a house, right? Then you're a renter for your entire life. And, and we're moving towards a world like the, the, the saying from the world economic forum, the, you will own nothing and be happy. Well, I don't, I don't want to live in a world like that. I want to live in a world where people are building and growing and able to own and possess their property and protect it for, for the future. Yeah. But on that point as well, a lot of people don't understand what's going on behind the scenes what's going on with these policymakers and how they're signing away their citizens' property rights. Yeah. They're doing it. And, and the citizens aren't even aware about this until it's like, uh, what do you say? Gradually, 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 then suddenly it all hits us, doesn't it? And that's what's going on at the moment. Yeah, Europe, that's... Anyway, I can see it. Th as that's, day. that's what makes me honestly the most sad because when I turn on the news, I see a lot of people who uh, appear very confident and very uh, strong in their in their presence and in their promises, but they lack the understanding of how economics works. And, and so they are calling for things that will ultimately hurt the very people they're trying to help. And we've seen that over and over again. And, and whenever I see politicians who are spewing out things that come from such a lack of knowledge, about economic theory and about history, it, it devastates me that they represent people and that people are clinging to them for hope and for help. Um, we really need an awakening around the world, especially with policymakers, about economics and history. It's it's We're really not done justice in schools to teach us financial literacy and how money actually works and how the banking system works. We need to better understand that from a young age so that we're kind of rooted with that knowledge. Um, and we don't have that. So we have a lot of politicians that are turning to things that are very ideological. Um, and some of it is completely nonsensical. And they're literally hurting people and removing their freedoms and removing their privacy in order to keep them sort of safe or, or make sure that things are convenient and we need to protect people but the only way to protect them is to inform them to empower them with knowledge and empower them with understanding this kind of technology um because freedom is fragile freedom is not something that just you can it just stays forever once you acquire freedom no it's actually very fragile and can be taken away from you and then it's very hard to get back definitely definitely yeah and, and as i said we can see all these things well some people can a lot of people can't but thank God we can. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, let's talk a little bit about BRICS. Okay. What's going on with BRICS? Yeah. And uh, I know for myself, from what I know anyway, so it's been going for nearly 15 years. It only really started kicking in there in 2022. Uh, now there's 11 member states uh, after joining full BRICS membership. That's given about 70% of the world's population. Yeah. into that BRICS consortium. Uh, they announced recently that they're going to be releasing some type of a stable coin. Uh, how can you see BRICS affecting what's going on in the world and how some different shifts are going to happen? Sure. So I think it's really important to monitor these types of developments. And I certainly am I'm someone who's very interested in these conversations. And I try to find experts um, that are really tracking uh, what's happening with BRICS. But I also don't think it's a source of alarm for some sort of massive shift to happen tomorrow where suddenly the U.S. dollar disappears or is no longer no longer the global reserve currency and, and suddenly we're all transacting with the digital yuan. I don't think anything like that is going to happen. I think we're part of a very slow and gradual shift and, and change. Um I mostly think that you have to kind of distinguish between the U.S. dollar as a as a reserve currency versus a reserve asset, because it is very clear that nations around the world are moving away from the dollar as a reserve asset. And they are moving to things like purchasing gold again, which is that tier one um, sort of reserve asset that they used to hold in, in large amounts. They're returning to it. Um, I think that we're going to move into a system that is just in general more multipolar, uh, where nations distrust each other more than ever before. We're moving away from the globalization that we've seen in, in the last couple of decades. I think we're moving in the other direction. And, and one of the reasons why I'm so bullish on Bitcoin is because 
if these countries decide to say um, back their currencies with something like a basket of commodities or, or gold, really um, Bitcoin is is a better reserve asset because it is so verifiable and decentralized and secure and no one has to trust each other. None of these nations at the end of the day trust one another. And we've had such privilege being the United States where everyone trusted the dollar, but we weaponized the dollar and we um, have... Um, had the sanctions that basically encourage countries to form things like BRICS and slowly de-dollarize. And so I think we're going to see a slow and steady shift to no longer holding as many treasuries, which will which will hurt us, right? Because we need to keep printing in order to keep the whole thing afloat. I don't think it's going to be a tectonic, like massive shift. I don't think we're going to necessarily move to another currency. I think the dollar will still be used as a transaction layer. Um, but I think that Bitcoin will actually fill the role that is very needed in terms of being a global reserve asset. And I think that that will take probably at least a decade to play out, if not more. Yeah, great, great. And then can you see maybe Bitcoin being used to trade commodities or even Bitcoin backing maybe a new type of digital currency? Can you see something like that maybe happening in the future? Maybe not yeah, now, I mean, but maybe in the future. Sure. I mean, anything that is... Um... I think that even Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who is a pro-Bitcoin candidate for U.S. president here here in our country, he said that he would like to see the U.S. dollar once again backed by something that is scarce. And he said that within that basket, he would potentially use Bitcoin. Um, so, you know, there are talks about it, but I, I just I'm not really um I, I'm not really here to speculate on what's gonna happen in the near term. I just think that slowly slowly gradually then suddenly yeah. maybe yeah. Um, people will realize that bitcoin is that pristine collateral and the most verifiable scarce secure asset that you could possibly have it is institutional grade it is nation state reserve grade and it's just going to take time for all of that to play out and that's one of the reasons why it's so important to educate the general public because it's the general public that needs to be able to save and accumulate and they will benefit from the most when all of a sudden a nation state that gets to print their own money can buy up a bunch of Bitcoin, right? So they're going to send <laughs> send the price spiking. So I just, I think, I think it's so important to just focus on the people acquiring Bitcoin because this is a bottom up movement. This is an emergent phenomenon from the economy and from the working class. And it's not top down imposed on us the way fiat is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and something you, you touched on there briefly about nation states. Yeah, Nation states have the opportunity, as you said, to just print money. And buy yeah. Bitcoin. Yes. And I think some of them are secretly doing it. <laughs> yeah. You'd be very surprised at what's really going smart, on out there. Smart thing to do. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. So what would you say to our to our viewers then uh, about maybe what is coming and how people can protect themselves from all your work that you're doing and people that you're interviewing and all your trips around the world? Yeah, I mean, I would just say that if you're new to Bitcoin, don't get intimidated. Um, don't feel like you have to have 50% of your wealth. I mean, it took me a while to get that comfortable to be able to put the majority of what I make and and hold in Bitcoin, but I do now because I feel more comfortable and I understand the short-term volatility. So I would just say learn as much as you can. Knowledge is power. This is an amazing technology. Um, there's nothing more empowering in the world, I think. And um, and yeah, check out my shows if you, if you want to learn about Bitcoin. Yeah. And to wrap it up there, how would people contact you and, and find you? Tell us about your website, your uh, coin sure. stories. Yeah. Yeah, my show is called Coin Stories. You can find it on YouTube and all the podcasting platforms. Uh, you can email me at natalie at talkingbitcoin.com. Talkingbitcoin.com is my website with a lot of my work there. Uh, I have a free newsletter, nataliebrunel.substack.com, and I'm very active on Twitter. Amazing. So, Natalie, thank you. Thanks for your time. And it was amazing meeting you in person. And we will meet again with the family. Yeah, thank you so, so much. It was so nice to meet you. I hope to get out to Dublin because I really want to eat at Kavanaugh's again. That was my favorite meal in Dublin. <laughs> definitely, definitely. We'll go for a meal together if you ever come over, yeah? With the family. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Cheers.